We begin in the name of God. Greetings. Welcome to another session of From the Desk of Khamdi. The series of discussions continues on the 23 question series, and today we begin the 146th episode. The topic under discussion is What is Hadith? Today we begin the 12th episode of this series. Let us start. Yohamdi Sahab, thank you very much for your time. What are the standards for understanding Hadith? What principles have you stated in your book Mizan? The first principle was discussed. I request Ghamdi Sahab to connect our discussion to that point and tell us according to you, what are the standards for the proper understanding of the content of Hadith, that is, of the topics discussed within it? I had said there are five principles. I have stated those under five headings. The first principle, was that a person should develop a literary taste of the language. This holds true for the Quran as well as for Hadith, or if you wish to understand any other discourse, it can be in any language of the world. The first thing that would be expected is that the people who are writing its explanation or exegesis, or even if they wish to explain a poet's writings or make you understand the writing of a sage or wise person, then a good taste of the language he has written in should be developed by them. The point discussed here was the level of the language in which the hadith exist. It isn't sufficient for a person to merely read a book or two on syntax or morphology to develop some idea of the Arabic language and then start writing on this subject. Going further, he should develop the expertise when he is able to comprehend the difficult styles of writing, and if he comes across material which does not measure up to that standard, he should be able to reject it merely on the basis of the language. Now, the second heading is interpretation in the light of the Quran. I have written, the second principle is hadith should be interpreted in the light of the Quran. People generally state it in the reverse order. They think the Quran needs to be understood in the light of the hadith. What I say is, hadith requires understanding in the light of the Qur'an. Why this? What is the reason for this principle? I have elaborated on it. In Islam, the status occupied by the Qur'an has been alluded to earlier. It is the book of God. It is the divine word. Everything in it has a scheme and harmony. It has reached us in the words of God Almighty. God has made it a conclusive proof in itself. He has stated about it that it has been revealed so that it becomes decisive between all differences. Prior to it, we have stated the status of the Qur'an in religion. The Qur'an is also the most definite and authentic record of whatever Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did in his status as a prophet and messenger. That is, if we wish to find out about the Prophet, peace be upon him, or the history of the times of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and some point with regard to it has been discussed in the Qur'an, like the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Ohad, the Battle of Ahzab, the circumstances in Medina, the mischief-making of the hypocrites, various things relating to the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I have given examples of these matters. It is the Qur'an which is the decisive source in all these things. God Almighty himself pointed to an incident in the Qur'an, or he stated parts of that event, or the debate that might have arisen about it. Some important stages have been confirmed by him. The Qur'an is the most definite and authentic record of whatever Muhammad, peace be upon him, did as a prophet and a messenger. Consequently, most topics covered in the Hadith are related to the Qur'an like a branch is related to a stem, or an explanation is related to the text it explains. That is, most topics covered in the Hadith are related to the explanation or derivation of what the Qur'an stated. That is, some fundamental point or principle is stated by the Qur'an from which corollaries are deduced, and these are stated in Hadith. If the Qur'an states some directive of religion or comments on some incident, its status is that of the foundation. In every case, it has the status of the original text. Whatever in the form of hadith or narration comes to us would either be a corollary of that original or a commentary of that text. Every person who studies hadith will clearly observe both these things. Without recourse to the original text, it is obvious that corollaries and explanations cannot be understood. That is, if you have access to the foundational principle, 
you may discover how the corollary relates to it. And if you have a particular text, then you are in a position to ascertain whether something really is an explanation of it. If it is, why was it required? Therefore, if you do not have the text, how will you understand the explanation or corollary? That is, we will have a text before us, for example, if we are reading Khalib's poetry. While reading its explanation, a poem of Khalib won't be understood. That is, first the poem or text of the poem would be read. Its difficulties will confront us. Why it needs an explanation would be felt by us. Subsequently, when we read the explanation with the text, the explanation becomes clear. What is the explanation for? Which word has been explained? Which composition of the sentence has been clarified? That is only then will all this happen. Even if the explanation is for the idea, that is one is the explanation of words and narration. Another is when the text has a purport. The Quran wants to say this. The Quran has said this. In that case, you will first ascertain what the Quran has stated. Hence, if the text is not before us, the explanation cannot be understood. If the principle is not there, its corollary, though it can be speculated about, there can be various difficulties in understanding the corollary. Both these things should be considered. Without recourse to the original text, it is obvious that corollaries and explanations cannot be understood. If all the mistakes in interpreting hadith are minutely analyzed, this situation becomes abundantly clear. That is, the Quran is in chaste Arabic. It is the word of God. Each sentence has a proper context. The Quran has a definite scheme. And this confusion never happens about the Quran that a sentence has been quoted without our knowledge of its context. The entire Quran is in our possession. If this book uses particular styles of address, we can access that as well. If it employs a terminology for something that too becomes evident, this thing is not found in hadith. Hence, the question is completely ruled out that we must think about the Quran depending on hadith. Hadith depends on the fact that it is seen in the light of the Quran. That is, if it is a corollary, it should be seen in the light of the original words. And if it is an explanation, it should be seen in the light of the text. If all the mistakes in interpreting hadith are minutely analyzed, this situation becomes abundantly clear. The incidents of stoning people to death in the times of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Here I have cited examples and great mistakes have been committed here. The incidents of stoning to death in the times of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the killing of Kabi bin Ashraf. Incidents of stoning to death imply that the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave some criminals the punishment of stoning to death that is, death by stoning, these incidents have been narrated and it is not possible to deny their occurrence. However, what was the crime for which this punishment was meted out? People have tried to understand this through some narrations and some experts of jurisprudence have expressed their opinions about it. What mistake was made in understanding them? If you look at them in the light of the Quran, the situation looks different and if one tries to understand the Quran, from the other way around, then you have to say either that some verses have been abrogated or employ devices like tabadul or tagayur. So the situation changes completely. The incidents of stoning to death, the assassination of Kaab ibn Ashraf, that is a person was especially ordered to be killed by the Prophet, peace be upon him. This act looks objectionable. However, relate this incident with the original text or principle stated in the Quran. Punishment meted out in the graves, narratives of intercession, same is the situation for them as well. That is, if you look at them separately, the point would not become clear, questions would arise. Rather, referring to some Quran statements, those narrations would seem inconsistent. However, if the Quran verses are foregrounded and the circumstances it describes for death are looked into or what it describes about the aftermath of death, and if God Almighty has to deal with someone before Judgment Day happens, what text has He revealed for it? Keep them as references post that there is no difficulty in understanding the narrations. In the matter of intercession as well, the Quran has made it a topic. It has said why intercession would be needed. It has told who those people are in whose favor it will be. 
It has narrated the conditions for it as fixed by God Almighty. If you understand all these things, there remains no confusion about the narrations. What the real point is becomes clear. How do these relate with the principles described by God Almighty? And if the narrators have committed mistakes in their narration of it, that comes forth clearly too. In narrations like Umirtu Anukatila Nas and Mam Badala Dinuhu Faktulu, these are references to two narrations. Umirtu Anukatilu Nas, in it the Prophet, peace be upon him, stated that I have been directed for fight, Kital, with people. The directive to fight is given and further, the extent to which he would fight is stated. That is what the limits of fighting are. When he states the directive to fight, the first question asked would be, what is its end? That is whether the fight is to end oppression and injustice, or to help some oppressed, or to answer aggression? Is the kital to defend, or to create an environment of peace? Or is it for another objective? The point stated in this narration, the objective becomes incomprehensible. Rather, it appears contrary to some Quran statements. However, look at it in the light of the Quran, and then see the motives the Quran describes for kital, or fighting. Then it becomes clear that there is no mistake in the narration. People are making a mistake in understanding it by not relating it to the Quran. Same is the case with Mam Badala Dinuhu Faktuluhu. One who changes his religion should be killed. The punishment of Irtidad, apostasy, has been based on this narration. However, what does it mean? What is it related to? Has this directive really been given in our religion that till Qiyamah the freedom of people has been taken away? That is, if there is a Muslim or someone born in a Muslim family, then he has no liberty to forsake this religion. Thus, the principle of God stated in La Ikraha Fidin stands nullified. If a person is born in a Muslim family, you are now closing the doors of free will on him. The Quran says this is clear guidance. We have made everything clear. The right path and guidance of God Almighty has been made clear. Following this, Man Sha'afal Yumin Wa Man Sha'afal Yakfur. So this situation does not remain clear with respect to the relation of the narrations with the Quran. When we see it in the light of the Quran, everything becomes clear. Directives like Umirtu Anukatilu Nas and Mambadala Dinahu Faktuluhu have caused confusion due to misinterpretation as efforts were not made to relate them with their original revelations in the Quran. In short, if this principle is kept in consideration, many perplexities are resolved in understanding the Hadith. Therefore, in my books and discussions, I have elaborated on all these things. I have explained the reality of the incidents of stoning. I have written detailed essays on it. If someone wishes, they may refer to my book, Burhan. Why was Kaab bin Ashraf killed? I have elaborated on it, and for that, you may refer to my book, Makamat. There is a chapter or an essay where I have explained what the punishment for Tawhine Risalat or insult to the Prophet is. How has it been described? What lies in its backdrop? That too has come into discussion there. Its reality has been clarified there. Regarding the punishment in graves, the narrations have been explained. We have worked on the narrations and arranged them in order, published in Ilmun Nabi. People can refer to them to understand how they become clear in the light of the Quran, so that a sensible person not only understands their reality, but accepts them without confusion. The same is the case with Umirtu an Uqatilan Nas, and the same with punishment of apostasy. For detailed discussions, they may refer to my books, Burhan and Maqamat. Ramdi Sahab in the Itmam Hujjat series too. Similarly, we have done detailed discussions on Itmam Hujjat in this series. All these things have been analyzed and we have explained that when the law of Itmam Hujjat, conclusive proof of God's truth, is ascertained through the Quran, how does it impact many directives, whether related to the Quran or Hadith? We have systematically discussed them topic-wise, hence the aim here is to pinpoint them. The reason is that we are discussing principles. The details of none of them can be discussed now. People interested may read them. They will understand if hadith is understood in the light of the Quran. 
how its difficulties and issues get resolved, how confidence in hadith develops, and how the reality opens up that our scholars have transmitted this corpus with utmost care. Gamdi Sahab, the point is elaborated, the second principle that hadith would be understood in the light of the Quran, and you said that the most reliable and authentic source of history of those times is the Quran itself. When we read exegesis, we generally see when the surah was revealed, its context, the backdrop in which it was revealed, the situations of those times, and who were the characters discussed. We see that such things are learned from narrations for understanding surahs of the Quran. As you say, this is history. Isn't it the work of history to tell us which surah was revealed when? So history is the door or channel. So in this matter too, the Quran would have an edge over history? The Quran itself says this. We have analyzed each surah to tell this. You may look at Tadabbarul Quran or my Tafsir al Bayan, the introduction of surahs is written there. From the content of the surahs, it becomes clear what the period of revelation was, the time this surah is read out, who are the addressees, what are the things discussed, when narrations are seen through the Quran. We understand whether the period fixed by the narration conforms to the period of the surah evident in its Tafsir. Or the point stated in the narration isn't merely a statement of an application. We learn all these things through it. It is a reality that if narrations relating the cause of revelation aren't understood in the light of the Quran, such misunderstandings develop that a person may doubt the Quran. Everything gets fragmented. There would be one reason for the revelation of one verse and another reason for the verse succeeding it. Regarding this, Imam Razi in his tafsir has made harsh comments. He said, if things are looked in this light, accepting any surah of the Quran as a surah will not be possible. Strange, okay. The Quran has been arranged by God Almighty. Its surahs have been revealed by God Almighty. It is transmitted to us in exact form. When you ascertain the backdrop, history, audience, the topics of the surah in relation to the complete call of the Quran, which stage of inzar or warning it is, after ascertaining them all, only then the significance of the narrations about reason for revelation becomes clear. Okay, Ghamdi Sahab, clarify another point. You said the four corners of the Quran, the light of the Quran, the principles and rules stated by the Quran will be the backdrop for our understanding of these narrations. There are disagreements in understanding the Quran itself, so it is possible that some scholar accepts a narration in the light of the Quran, while another rejects the narration in the light of the Quran too. Even though the Quran is made the standard, the difference would still be there. Differences will be there. You cannot end differences. The disagreements will last till the world lasts. There would be disagreement over understanding the universe. There would be differences over the understanding of the physical laws governing the world. Our topic isn't the differences between people. We are telling what the right methodology for understanding is. That is what methodology should be adopted to resolve differences. What should be the principles for understanding? If you refer to something, what path should you adopt? There are many reasons for disagreement. I have explained many times that lack of knowledge often is the reason behind it. Lack of reflection also becomes the reason. God Almighty has recorded all things in his book, after which there should be no disagreement. However, in the case of human beings, even if lacking in knowledge, that would cause disagreement. If there is deficient reflection, that would become another reason for disagreeing. Along with it, there are various preconceived notions in our minds. It is difficult to unlearn them. We have this experience that if an opinion was heard, understood, and adopted earlier, that opinion dominates the mind. It becomes the guideline for the person reading the verses of the Quran. However, the moment he gets rid of that dominance, the Quran makes the point clear, the exact reality of what it has stated. So, these are our human weaknesses due to which disagreement persists. The difference is natural, but what is the process to resolve it? That is, if a person wishes to lead his life in the light of the book of God with peace of mind, does that light exist in his possession? The answer is he has access to it. However, it is necessary he strengthens his knowledge, always makes use of his mind, leave no stones unturned, does not lag, and does the required homework. 
And then when he enters the study of the Qur'an, he should understand the path to its knowledge is its words. The words provide the door. Therefore, grasping the meaning of the word, considering the composition of the sentence, delving into the context and backdrop, and rising above all prejudices, the effort should be made to understand it. He would get that light removing the darkness around him. Gamdi Sahab, you clarified the point. I will present one last question for clarification regarding the second principle. Please tell the place where you stated the principles for understanding the Quran, you stated one principle that for understanding the Quran itself, one has to know the historical backdrop. Where had the messenger, peace be upon him, come? Who is the audience? What are the existing nations? When you state the principle that we have to study this historical corpus, that is hadith in the light of the Qur'an, and there you state that the historical backdrop should be at the back of the understanding of the Qur'an itself. So aren't these two principles contradicting? We should know the Arabic language for understanding the Qur'an. Obviously, you will learn the Arabic language, its vocabulary, morphology, and syntax, and styles. You will develop mastery over these things. It is a must to understand the Qur'an. When the Qur'an discusses something or any book discusses something, the general history is in its backdrop. If I write an article mentioning Lahore, will I tell readers Lahore is a city? It is accepted reality. You should be aware of that history. Likewise, if there is a custom prevalent in a society, you should be aware of that tradition. When I say that all probable meanings of the word should be in view, then all the points in the chapter on fundamental principles of my book, Mizan, should be known to you, then open its door, the final decision would be of the Qur'an itself. The words of the Qur'an would decide what you are equipped with while entering, they would provide permission whether they accept them or not. Only then will you have access, because when you read the Qur'an, your knowledge should be solid. What is that knowledge? The knowledge of the language? the historical backdrop, the awareness of incidents and happenings, the knowledge of the circumstances, all this comprises knowledge. If this knowledge is weak, you won't be able to access the book. Ramdi Sahab, your point is well taken. The principles of understanding hadith have been described by Ramdi Sahab in his book Mizan. The second principle came under discussion. Hadith would be reviewed in the light of the Quran. The time ends now. We shall be back again in your service. Thank you very much for your time till now. Thank you very much.